All right. So let's try to start again. So my name is Andreas Lacian, as the name suggests, and my thick accent, I'm from the northern part of Germany, Hamburg, which is probably the most beautiful city in the world. Um, we can argue probably. after. Probably, yeah, or well, likely, I, I mean. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I really like networking. And um, actually, um, after leaving the university, electrical engineering, I did nothing but networking. So don't ask me about anything else like music or movies or stuff like that. Um, I recently took a look in my, in my drawer and, and found some certificates from back then. So I do have collected quite, quite a number. Um, CNX, I really like. I probably put up a sticker someday on my laptop, um, 99, so 10, 20 years ago. And um, the consistent thing is networking is great, still great. It's still the best place to be. And it's all about C's, like compute, right? We, we serve for purpose. We, we have customers out there we, we would like to connect to. And if you don't know what to do um, next month or um, over Christmas time, um, go for a nice new open certification for open networking. Maybe that's something um, you would like to do next time to, for your MBOs or for something like that. It's doable, so. But um, the ask was to talk a little bit about um, design, about design for enterprise networks. So the density of hyperscalers, uh, customers in my hometown is hometown is very low, so I'm mostly focusing on larger enterprise customers. Um, that's a better chance to spend my time. And um, let's take a look what we can do with Minipack in that space. So we we just had a question about the um, interface modules. Um, that modular chassis comes comes with eight slots, um, so it is modular, but it combines the best of both both worlds from a very simple um, one place control plane, but still allows you to, to have modularity in your, in your system. The point to take away probably for next month when you order the first 100 units is that the PIM module start with two. So in slot number one, we have the brain, um, some kind of CPU, um, which runs an operating system of your choice more or less. So the interesting part for us is the, the eight modules starting with number two. And we probably have a well, decent numbering scheme in place, SW PIM number, P, and then the port number from 1 to 16 for the first module. And then you can write your scripts and deploy that via Ansible or Salt or whatever you like to deploy. Um, the question was in the former talk about other PIM options. So on the long run, there will be an option with 400 gig, four ports, 400 gig. Um, for an enterprise environment, I would argue that the price point right now is probably mm, outside the expectation. But it's good to keep that in mind that it's available from a well, technical point of view. In theory, there are also options in between. We'll see how the industry would well, pick that up or how the demand um, will dictate what is being available. But when 400 gig comes to, to surface in, in larger quantities, I expect that the 100 gig pricing for optics and cables will go down, offering even more use cases in that space. But for me, it's a 100 gig, 128 port offering. So there's no 100 megabit ILO connection available. So it's, it's for a specific use case design for moving from F4 to F16 if we were Facebook. But we are not, so we will need to take a close look where we can use that fine piece of engineering art. And one option is um, that we're running that we are running an enterprise network with ports, port number one, port number two. We have all our compute and appliances connected. Well, single home, multi home. Most likely in an enterprise environment, we still need to comply to layer two connectivity in a dual home fashion. So we run MLEC on our top of rack switches over here. And then we have a layer three core design, leaf spine. So if we have multiple of those parts, we need a scaling layer. And so in this case, we have quite, um, quite an interesting network with five hops when we go from a container or virtual machine from one part to another part. Um, you could state that that is a problem. Um, I think it's, it's a better design. It's 
nicely working. We have that in production um, in multiple, multiple places. So that by itself is not a problem. But we could, we could make it a problem. We could make it a problem for us by looking at, could we optimize that environment? Could we make it, well, consist of less hops, less control planes, less optics, et cetera? So that's one thing where we could start. A variant of that design, which is also deployable in your simulated environment via Vagrant with one click, oh, click in the wrong direction, would be to move the super spine layer um, as, a, as a connectivity point to, to exit top of rack switches. And um, that by itself, I feel even more appealing to me from a design perspective. Um, the benefit would be you have a nice place to influence control to filter what to hand over to the other side. In both cases, I would expect an enterprise environment to not only move to a layer three environment over here, so to have all those fabric links configured with an IPv4 or IPv6 address manually or automatically, but also to run an overlay on top. So for most enterprise customers, I still see the need, the ask to provide, a, well, in more and more cases, a con controller-less overlay environment. And the, since we are working in the open space, I would recommend or well, expect eVPN VXLAN being used here. So that both setups will work well. Um, with this set, setup over here, you are able to control uh, which information you want to propagate from one side to the other side. So it's a more robust way, but offers you um, a different oversubscription factor. Um, let's see, right direction. Now, both are valid, but when I worked at Accenture, we called it the approach to right side the environment, to strip it down as much as possible, to make it cost as, as, as least as possible, to reduce it to a bare minimum. And if that is your goal for your enterprise environment, that will be an option. And that's where Minipack would, would come to play. We can reduce the spine and the super spine layer and collapse that into, into one machine, into that four rack unit machine, 737 millimeters deep. So it, it would also fit in most enterprise racks in the cellar somewhere. But um, you will probably go with four of them, um, not necessarily fully populated, but you could collapse your layers together and end up with three instead of five hops between containers, VMs, located in different pots. And the number of pots you can directly connect, 128 100 gig connections are available. Um, in other terms, where I come from, that gives me a lot of room to grow into. It's not for the travel agency, family-owned, five people around the corner, right? So it's a more, a larger environment than that. So how do we get there? Um, one suggestion by a colleague of mine was, well, if you want a simple, simple solution like drawing a horse, start with drawing a unicorn, and then simple, simple step would be delete the horn. Well, German engineers are not known for good jokes, so um, I gladly took, took, his, took his drawing and <laughs> borrowed that as academic work, right? Borrowing someone else's work. But we should, we should spend some time to think about um, the original intended use case for Minipack. It was designed to move from F4 to F16, and that is definitely a different use case than our enterprise class network, right? It uses a specific network processor, a Tomahawk 3. Also a fine piece of engineering, but with a specific goal, with a specific customer use case in mind. Um, it is the third generation out of the Tomahawk series, but it, it changes the feature set significantly. And that's something we definitely need to, to, to be aware of when we place that machine in our design. Um, also, the cost of optics, rather spend a day or two optimizing the physical layout of your data center to come up with distances maybe below 505 meters in order to use a sp specific optic and save big time on the optics. So 
the shorter the distance, the cheaper the optic. Or phrased differently, in most of my budget calculations, I spend most of the money on on the optics, not on the on the gear anymore. So um, optics are interesting, and we will wait for probably another month or so before we go to 400 gig. So if we go back in time a little bit and step back from, from the problem um, and, and, and justify a little bit the class concept, in 1930, um, telephone network, I picture myself in a, in a small village with 100, 200, 500 folks. And out of those, we have a leadership team consisting of four, um, a major, policeman, some spiritual leader, leader and maybe a magic, magician, or whatever. So they, they like to talk to each other and to, in order to build, build a switchboard. We need, we need for four by four connection, we need 16 cross points. So not a big deal, 1930, some, some, some time ago, even before we started to work on this field, right? So um, the village um, moves on over time, and more and more individual contributors would like to also communicate with each other. So we are moving from 100 inputs to 200 inputs to 500 inputs. And all of a sudden, we need a switchboard, which is mm, quite large. And um, so we need a lot of cross points. Mm, not a real challenge, not from a technical side, just unfortunately, the cost of that switchboard, of that, of that solution, correlates with the number of cross points. So it's, it's becoming extremely expensive. And um, all designs I've seen which are using a crossbar at the back are technically great. I spent a lot of time explaining those, working with those. It's just awfully expensive and awfully complicated to build and to test. So mm, the solution would be to build instead a cross network and look for the cleanest and most simplest approach. And that would be hmm, one of our mini packs, for example. So from a physical um, space consideration, um, we need to find a layout for our data center where we make best use of the cabling traces, the distance, and the location of those mini packs. That picture is actually not a data center, but it looks like. When I, when I arrived yesterday evening in Amsterdam, it was raining. And I arrived at my hotel, which told me, well, sir, you're out of luck. I, I know that feeling. I work for net, in the networking field for a long time, so I'm always guilty. But they canceled my reservation. So mm, not really great. And I found another nice place. This one, it's a hotel. You see the, 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 the room size? It was an interesting experience. It will, I'm, I'm absolutely glad that they gave me a room. Um, but it's not, it's not my, my data center. But it looks like one. Maybe they should transfer that. So in reality, we have a data center consisting of multiple rows. And if you take a look at the lower right corner, we have, for example, one top of rack switch. <coughs> Based on the enterprise use case, it's most often a 10 gig slash 25 gig machine with four, six, eight uplinks. So using four <coughs> is, is feasible. We have two mini packs on the lower left side, and we have two mini, two mini packs on the <coughs> upper right side. And for that design, for that data center size, we most likely stay, even with a nice cabling layout, below 500 meters, which means we can <coughs> use CWDM uh, CWDM4 um, OCP, which should cover 500 meters at an interesting price point as a starting point. I took a peek in our, in our um, platform database and saw that also other cables are being supported, not the ones going beyond two kilometers, but shorter distances. So you could even come up with well creative designs where you place that machine in the middle and have some start cabling running. We, we did some of those back then for, for um, big data environments, et cetera, to save on cables. But that is, I think that is a real, realistic design and um, a realistic use case of the optics. Now, with the first PIM module installed, um, we have a little bit of support. And we grow with two, three, four uh, PIM modules to this size. And for an enterprise customer, I grew up in a mortgage bank, very conservative. We did installing of servers and network nodes with a suit and a tie, right? 
you should always wear something nice in the cellar. Um, that environment, still conservative, would probably like a solution which is, well, not used to 80, 90 percent, but comes with 50 percent space to grow, whether you need it or not. So with that size and with, well, four or five rows, um, I think we have a good use case um, for an enterprise data center. The workhorse horse inside is a Tomahawk 3 SX with 12.8 terabit capacity, which is probably far from every small travel agency, but um, it is designed for those hyperscalers. It comes with 50 gig lanes, which means we have four states with PAM4, um, but it's 50 gig. So um, what, we, what we use per PIM module is a reverse gearbox to convert that to 25 gig lanes and offering, offering 100 gig, 1600 gig um, interfaces, which is pretty nice. So um, that is something I would not expect to go farther down, even though the gearbox is technically feasible or able to do that. More importantly, um, that ASIC is designed, from my po personal private point of view, is designed for layer three environments for hyperscalers and removed a lot of layer two functionality. So it is not it is not, it is definitely not a box I would put as a top of rack switch or to put in a layer two environment. So whenever I see layer two, I would move away to, to another solution. It is a great box for layer three and it's a great box for running overlays over it. But overlays cannot be terminated or started at that box anymore. So there's no native VXLAN support included. It's a great IPv4, IPv6 spine or super spine. Servers are not directly connected. Well, I mean, I, this, this week I, I, was, I was talking for a Kubernetes event and they're running large machines. We are running a lot of POCs with 100 gig servers right now. So you could think theoretically about connecting servers with 100 gig to that machine for, for big data environment or Kubernetes environment, et cetera but just make sure you connect them with layer three. Do not go to that layer two path. And I think that is something you, know, you need to really carefully discuss with um, some, some NOS vendor of your choice, what combination is working and which is not so great. From a redundancy perspective, different companies have different points of view. That is F16 of Facebook. If one of those small blocks with some top of rack switches, some fabric switches, and some spines is failing, it doesn't really matter that much because you don't have not one block per region running. You used to have three, and now I believe they're going to six. So it's a different scale. We are more concerned about probably one leaf spine environment, and that gives us. Um, and for the number of mini packs we should consider or expect to use, I like the number three. My colleague likes the number four. So if you ask five people, you get six answers, right? Um, but the point is, it's not a good idea to assume that you should go down to two for that um, right sizing approach. So still have three or four at that spine or collapse spine layer um, available for redundancy and also in the case of maintenance, you take one machine out while this whole system is running and you still have complete redundancy with two or three machines still available. Now, the traffic flows are probably different than the traffic flows within Facebook. I think they're running just BGP and IP traffic there with their own application. We have a zoo in an enterprise environment. We probably have multiple projects running um, containers, virtual machines, etc. If we run EVPN for layer two, for location independent layer two and tenant services, um, and we, we have a design with Minipack where we have probably more than 100 top of rack switches, we might also touch the point where the scale of head end replication becomes a burden or becomes something we would like to look into or have at least an option in hand when we cross a border that we can go someplace. So one option would be to use uh, multicast to map your 
broadcast unknown unicast and multicast traffic to a multicast group and have the Tomahawk ASIC or a set of Tomahawk ASICs do the repl replication for the individual poor top of rack switch. So that option is available by the time that um, everything is supported and just talk with your, with your vendor of choice. Um, for Kubernetes, I see discussion points around the CNI you're using. So if you're, if you're shielding everything from the networking department, you're using an overlay, fine, you just need an IP tunnel endpoint. But if you use the slash 32 routing approach where you, where you push all, all container uh, host routes into the network, um, you might want to ask, about the Tomahawk 3 capabilities in terms of routing. And uh, what I've seen in the specs is it's, it's really doing a good job compared to Tomahawk 2, for example. It's an increase available, so it's getting better. So I think that would be also a valid and good, good use case. Um, from an overlay perspective over here with, with a hypervisor, um, regardless of whether it's MH, V, or T in, 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 in case of one particular vendor, but there multiple offerings. We have a lot of overlay um, communication between the compute nodes, but in most cases we have one cluster where actually the exit point, where the exit happens from that software-defined data center to the outside world, where we need to peer with BGP compared to layer 2 MLAC constructors over here. So we don't have a symmetrical data pattern in our, in our network anymore. So. I'm almost, almost in time, which is, um, from, my <laughs> from my perspective, a miracle. Um, so it's really nice. Um, from a scaling perspective, route entries increased. There, there are two modes inside the Tomahawk ASIC. Um, I don't know which one will be activated or available, but from a um, routing scale, from a layer three scale, it looks very positive to me. From a TCAM size for, um, Stateless packet filtering. Um, stateless packet filtering. I would not. I would not plan for my core, for my spine, for my collapse core in the first place. But it is there. It's available. It's it's good that it's available because for one use case, I certainly need it. Control plane policing is relying on on, on those TCAM entries, and it's certainly in place. So it's not a it's not a machine for ACLs. Definitely not. And the MAC entries are significantly reduced. Do not intend to, to use it as a layer two, um, layer two top of rack environment someplace. Um, that being said, it is a beautiful engineering result, both from a technical, from a physical perspective, as well from, from, from a software perspective. Um, I believe for certain larger use cases, it is the right sizing approach for design, it runs well in a layer three spine, and um, it's certainly very well usable for an EVPN environment for a collapsed leaf spine. If you have projects, let us know. We are here to help you, and um, I think I'm still in time. It's 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 <laughs> I can't believe myself. Any questions? Yes. Um, both are feasible. Well, that's a, the that's a first question, and um, I haven't looked at the at the mixing. Um, I just have looked at the V4 entries right now, just to get a get a feeling between Tomahawk two and three. And for the um, full mode, it is significantly increased. I think fifty percent or, or even more. So um, I would need to take a look at the at the specs, but they are not open anyhow. Oh, oh well, um, for, from, from the enterprise project perspective, I have large enterprise accounts who have a list with projects which are IPv6 compliant, and no one wants to uh, be on the other list with the non-compliant section. So from that perspective, from a political one, I would say um, it, is, it is needed to have something with IPv6. The VTAPs themselves are in most vendor implementations still IPv4 based, so there's no real um, point of, of, of getting to the tunnel endpoints with v6, but running v6 over that, that is 
certainly feasible and that is being used more and more in the um, public sector research and education segment even more um, but they have well they're spending our tax money right they're a little bit more flexible what they do anyhow and relax so um, depends always on, on the vertical but um, the real hard use case over here we're still waiting since 2001 yeah let's be a little bit patient <laughs> is it answered you other questions only good questions are allowed, right? Questions I can answer. No? All right. Thank you so much for your interest. Hope you have a wonderful remaining day. Hope to meet you all soon again someplace. And, well, take care. <laughs>